Welcome to the AMSA webinar, Exploring Online Service Delivery Principles and Practices. My name is Julie Shipp, AMSA's Language Program Manager, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. We would like to thank Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada for funding this event today. With me today in the AMSA media room is our multimedia specialist extraordinaire, Connor Roslin. Connecting with us from Vancouver, we have Olga Kanapelka from Ottawa, Rob McBride, and again remotely from Vancouver, Dr. Suzanne Smythe. There will be a brief Q&A after Olga and Rob's presentations, and a final longer Q&A after Suzanne's presentation. Before we get started, to find out more about you, we will host a few polls. So let's try poll number one. What is the focus of your work in supporting newcomers? Is it settlement and integration, language training, career and workplace development, research and policy, Swiss settlement workers and schools? And if none of these apply for you, please tell us what you do in the question box. So you can see the results of the poll there. So thank you very much for doing the poll and for tuning in everyone. That just gives us an idea of, of who's tuning in today. And again, you can always type in the question box what you do do if we missed you. Now for our second poll, please estimate the population of the geographic area of your organization. Are you from a small town, rural area, medium sized city, small urban center, mid-sized urban center, or a large urban center. So you can see the results there of the poll. Thank you very much for participating in that. And just one final introductory poll to get to know the type of services offered, particularly for those in smaller regions. So if you're from a smaller center or a, a small urban center, a medium-sized city, I mean, which services do you offer? Do you offer online or distance learning? Do you offer blended learning? Both online and blended? You don't offer online nor blended learning or you don't know, you're not sure. Okay, so we can see there some of the results coming up for smaller centers and what kinds of services they offer and overwhelm, well, not overwhelmingly, but we see that you're not offering services, but that is what we're here to, to talk about as well. So thank you for taking the time to tell us more about you so our presenters can make this webinar as relevant as possible for your realities. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Olga Kanapalka is a digital literacy researcher and curriculum developer at Immigrant Services Society of BC and has been a link instructor in the classroom for online platforms, including blended learning and distance learning for over six years. Olga's commitment to teaching English and curriculum development goes back 12 years to her time in Belarus. Olga has presented on the topic of online learning at various conferences across Canada and is currently pursuing graduate studies in technology-based distributed learning at the University of British Columbia. To begin, Olga will share the different approaches to online service delivery, which will be particularly helpful for those who don't yet offer those services and want to get to know a little bit more about them. And she'll also share the barriers and opportunities for students and teachers. So take it away, Olga. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Julie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about different kinds of online learning. Uh, then I will also cover approaches for implementation of PBLA online. And finally, I'll talk about some challenges and solutions for teachers and students when implementing technology-assisted learning. Thank you. So I'd like to start with an overview of different approaches to online learning. First, there is the flipped classroom. In this course, uh, in this classroom, the course content has shifted out of the classroom. This means that students study instructional materials at home, usually by watching instructional videos recorded by their teacher. Then they come to school to practice the new skills and they get, get guidance from their teacher. I love this model, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any link programs in BC which offer flipped classroom learning. 
If your organization does, please let us know in the question box. The next approach is blended learning. It's also known as hybrid learning. This learning suggests a reduced number of face-to-face -face hours when students spend part of the time studying online and part face-to-face. -face. In the right column, you can see the list of service provider organizations which offer blended learning in BC today. Some of these organizations use EduLink training, uh, while others use in-house learning management systems. Once again, please let us know if you're not included in this list. Next comes e-learning or online learning, which is 100% online. And that often means that a teacher and students can be located in different places. The largest provider of online learning in Canada is Link Home Study. They currently have 88 seats for students in BC. They also offer correspondence learning from st for students who do not have access to technology or the internet. If you'd like to learn more about them, please refer to the AMSA info sheet. It's going to be available in the resources section after the webinar, or you can contact Julie Shape directly. At Immigrant Services of BC, we also offer online learning to students. We provide services to students residing in the Sea to Sky Corridor, um, Sunshine Coast, and also ISS of BC's newcomer parents in Vancouver and Richmond who are on the child mining wait list. Our materials are BC based. And since we, we are lucky to have a PBLA regional coach on the team, we do offer PBLA aligned online and blended lessons. I thought you might be interested in seeing how this can be accomplished online. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you what our blended and online lessons look like. Uh, so PBLA ePortfolio components include goal setting, skill building, skill using tasks, assessment tasks, self-reflection, self-assessments, and learning progress reports. All of these components are present in our online only program, and most of them, except for the portfolio, are part of the blended delivery. So this is an overview of a blended lesson. As you can see, um, each PBLA lesson is divided into four weeks, three hours each. In week one, students start working on the lesson, they get introduced to the topic, they participate in the discussion forum to share their ideas and experiences, and they start building the new skills. In week two and week three, they continue working on skill building tasks, uh, and um, at the end of week three, they take a skill using task. They must finish that task in order to have access to the assessment task in week four. Uh, so this is uh, what a skill building activity might look like. It always includes a teaching text or maybe a teaching video, and then it's followed by practice activities. We try to offer immediate feedback to students whenever possible. As you can see here, they usually can check their answers right away and get comments right away without waiting for the teacher to grade. Uh, finally, in week four, which you cannot really see here, our students complete the assessment task. The teacher will then fill out and print out the assessment slip, and they can add it to their binder to do the student portfolio. So as you can see, blended learning allows students to gain additional artifacts for PBLA. Let's now move on to online only learning. Next slide. So this is an overview of an online lesson. At ISS of BC, it's intended to be covered by students in about nine hours. So it's open for one week and the students have about nine hours to complete it. Each lesson includes a checklist, one or two activities that introduce students to the topic, skill building activities, followed by the skill using task, and then the assessment task, which again, they can only open it after they have completed the rest of the lesson and got the feedback on their student, on their, sorry, uh, skill using task. So the assessment, um, the reading, writing, and listening assessment tasks are timed, and they can only be opened once. As speaking assessment is done on Skype or Zoom with a teacher, after the appointment, the teacher will fill out an assessment slip and upload it into the student portfolio, at which point a student is prompted to the self-reflection and self-assessment activity, and that completes the lesson. 
So this concludes the part of my presentation about PBLA. And I'd like to move on to more general challenges and solutions that teachers and students experience when starting online learning or teaching. So these are some common challenges for teachers. Among these challenges are uh, one, digital literacy skills or professional competence that teachers have with educational technology. Uh, their motivation to try and implement new technology. A huge learning curve that teachers experience when start teaching link and also access to technology. Some solutions that exist in BC right now is Learn IT to Teach training, which Rob is going to talk about that later today. And you can also get that more information uh, in the Migration Matters info sheet mentioned uh, on the slide. Another way to train and support instructors is by offering in-house training and PD days. At ISSVC, we provide in-house training for all new instructors. That training is paid and it usually takes 10, 11 hours. Uh, next, please, let's talk about students. So before starting an online course or a blended course, the most common challenge for students is digital literacy skills. And in some cases, access to technology and the internet connection. While Suzanne is going to talk later today about problems with accessibility, I'm going to focus on what support exists to help students with the low digital literacy skills. Uh, so first, at ISS FBC, we offer student training courses. Uh, there is one for higher level students and one for lower level students to help them get the skills necessary to study in blended or online classes. After a student completes the student training course, he or she has a foundation Skype session with the teacher. This is an important part of the training since learners are given a chance to introduce themselves, meet the teacher, ask any questions they have about the course, share their uh, concerns and share their learning goals. When I do the session, I usually explain to the student how to share their computer screen with me so I can guide them and get an idea of their digital literacy skills. Also, ISSFBC, in partnership with UBC Learning Exchange, VCC, and BELT, is now working on an exciting new digital literacy curriculum project funded by IRCC. One great thing about this project is that we're going to develop materials to support students of different levels. We begin with literacy uh, level and go all the way up to CLB6 students. The project has three stages. Uh, research stage, development, and field testing. We are now in the development stage. Once the project is wrapped up in March 2020, we're going to share the research findings and the instructional materials. And these are the common challenges for students during the course. Uh, number one is usually technical issues, such as, for example, a broken link or when a student is unable to record their voice here, a lot will depend on the teacher being able to provide timely support. It is worth mentioning, though, that teachers should be careful with their scheduling. They don't need to be always present or immediately present, but they need to set office hours and let students know how quickly they can expect a response. In some cases, that might not be enough and students need more uh, support. To help with technology-related issues, in some of our sites, we provide drop-in tech support sessions. And in more distant communities, we often find community volunteers for students through our partner organizations. The next common challenge is time management skills, uh, like not being able to meet the deadlines, not completing lessons, or not showing up for a class video conference. To help students improve, each lesson has to have a predictable structure, very consistent, clear expectations and clear outcomes. Uh, we use a combination of labels with dates, calendars, and reminder messages or emails to help students stay, keep, keep track of their activities. And finally, let's talk about student engagement. Recent research has shown that um, social presence, that's interacting with peers, and uh, teaching presence help maintain students' interest and commitment. So to support learners, a course should include a combination of asynchronous and synchronous activities 
asynchronous activities are those when students can work on any time, um, any place. And synchronous activities are video live, video conferencing with teachers and other classmates. So here are some testimonials from our blended and online students that reflect some of the benefits of online learning, such as the ability to study anywhere, anytime, often balance in a career, family life, and school. I'm going to read them out to you. The first, uh, because I have a full-time job, so I can study anytime when I have a chance. The next, I can study with my pace. Also, through the class chat, I got a friend. She encouraged me lots, so I could keep going. And I care for my children, and now I can study on, on only online, which is really cool. And I'd like to finish, last slide please, with the words that I just recently found and they resonated with me. These are the words of Kirbig and Boak, cited by Anderson in his article, Theory and Practice of Online Learning. The quote goes like this, it is not the internet skills alone which determine competency, but the user's strong sense of internet efficacy that enables them to effectively adapt to the requirements of working in this environment. Thus, the effective online teacher should uh, is all constantly probing for learner comfort and competence with the uh, intervening technology and providing safe environment for, for learners to increase their sense of internet efficacy. So that's just uh, some food for thought. Thank you for listening and uh, let me know what questions you have. Thank you for your presentation, Olga. That's fantastic. Please submit your questions for Olga, everyone, using the question box. Tweet using the hashtag AMSA events or email your questions to apodal at amsa.org. So we do have a few questions for you, Olga. And the first question, a couple of short little questions to start. What okay. LMS are you using? Uh, we're using Moodle. Okay. And the next question, Olga, is how many students are enrolled in the course? So some people are curious about some of the... the oh. That's an to say. Is that about the blended course or online only course? Do you... That's a great question. If Michelle, you could um, clarify online only. Online only. So we have two classes, two groups. One is CLB four to six, and uh, I, I don't want to lie, but it's about eighteen students in that class. So divided between Vancouver, Richmond new parents, and then City Sky, Sunshine Coast, Powell River students. And the second CLB seven to eight course is a smaller course. Uh, it's a smaller group. It's, um, I think about eight to 10, roughly. Great, thanks, Olga. So another question here that has come in is, is the assessment also done online? I think that's a great question for anyone who hasn't yes. worked with the, the online learning and blended learning yet. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, in both cases, the assessments are done online. So I teach the online only course. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, so as I mentioned in the presentation, the reading, uh, writing and listening assessment would be timed. So we make sure that the students can only open it after they have worked through the lesson. They can only open it after they have gotten feedback on the skill using task. And it's very similar in the format to the skill using task. And then the student can open it once, they have a timer, they can see the timer. If by any chance they can't finish it on time, the computer shuts down their, their, the quiz or whatever it is, and, but the, the answers get saved. Um, if, of course, anything happens and the student opened by mistake and they closed it and they can access it again, as a teacher, I can reopen it for the students, but usually it doesn't happen. Uh, for the speaking assessment, we meet face to face, well, face to face, either in Skype or Zoom. Um, and then, then we do, I, I listen, they speak, and I fill out my assessment slip. So, yes, it's all it's done online. Thank you, Olga. Another question that has come in is about outreach activities. So, the question is for the online only. Mm -hmm. I the, the distance learning, are there any outreach activities that students are prompted to do to connect with the community? Uh, sometimes it depends on the lesson. Sometimes they are. Uh, we sometimes have a wiki, so that's uh, 
a page where students can that, that they can collaborate on and sometimes we'll give them questions like go to your community interview a person come back and share your replies uh, i wouldn't say it happens too often but we, we try and embed that in the online course as well okay great Another question that comes in is about certification. Mm -hmm. Is there any certification issued by the end of the learner's study? Yeah, yeah. And yes, of course. That's similar, exactly the same thing as what students would get in the regular face-to-face -face yeah. classroom? It's exactly the same certificate, yes, because it's completely PBLA online. They collect their artifacts as well in their binder. You do the progress report, progress conferencing with the students. So it's exactly the same thing, just online. And they get the exact same certificate. Okay, and I think we'll just uh, take one more question now. And this is also from another participant. Hi, Olga. Are the drop-in tech support sessions supervised by the link teacher? Could you repeat that question again? The drop-in tech support sessions mm. that you mentioned, are those supervised yeah, yeah. by the link teacher? Uh, I'm not sure if we usually we have those. I know we have those in Squamish. I, I, I would need to get back to you later on that question. I know that we have that in Squamish and the student would come in and as far as I know, they are done by one of our qualified link teachers, yes, as far as I know. So okay, they would then. grab their laptop, come to, the, to their office, they would either drive from, sometimes they come from Pemberton, Whistler, they usually go to Squamish, that's the closest office that we have, and they would get their help there. Okay, great. We also have uh, some, and I'll mention this later on, um, there are programs across the province that are drop-in, to support digital literacy. And so I'll mention that a little bit later as well. There's a lot going on in terms of that, but we'll come back to that. Thank you so much for everyone for all your questions and thank you, Olga. We'll come back to you again mm -hmm. in the, question and the final question and answer period. And we do have some more questions for you, but we'll, we'll move on next to our poll number four. For this poll, what area of online service delivery do you feel you need more knowledge of? And you can choose any that apply. Teacher training, teacher training options, how CLBs, Canadian language benchmarks, and portfolio-based language assessment fit into online service delivery, digital literacy skills of clients, teachers, and staff potentially. Is it access, connectivity to internet and devices? Or is it leadership training? And if there's are if there are any other areas of interest that you feel you need more knowledge of, please put that in the question box. So thank you very much for answering the poll. And that also can give everyone a chance to see what the others are thinking online. So thank you very much. Next, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Rob McBride is the Learn IT to Teach Project Manager of Administration and Communication and has been the Executive Director of New Language Solutions since its inception in 1983. Rob taught adult newcomers to Canada for many years and has worked as a researcher, writer, and producer, principally in the settlement language training and adult literacy basic skills sectors industries. Rob works on projects where building basic knowledge and skills has the maximum positive impact on the work and personal lives of learners. Rob will provide an overview of teacher training and what to expect with some upcoming tools and supports. So over to you, Rob. Thanks so much, Julie. Thanks for the nice introduction and thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to BC professionals in the in the settlement language training field and the settlement fields. Um, New Language Solutions is a registered charity with a volunteer board of directors, uh, all of whom are settlement language training professionals. And we exist uh, not as a direct service provider. In other words, we don't uh, operate language training classes. We uh, work to enable uh, the 250 plus service provider organizations across Canada to do that uh, on behalf of their learners. So today I'm going to talk about the Learn IT to Teach Project uh, teacher training. Um, and uh, for, for some additional details, 
Julie and AMSA have prepared the link and online learning uh, info sheet that uh, you have access to at AMSA. Um, I'm also going to talk about the, some of the principles behind branded learning and the opportunities, challenges, and barriers, some of which, uh, well, most of which Olga has already mentioned. And I'm going to talk about uh, how are people incorporating blended learning and what do we know about blended learning imitation, implementation and link. Uh, so, for example, I'll, I'll touch on a report which all of you can have access to a, a link blended learning demonstration project we completed earlier this year at uh, the Burnaby District School Board in the Lower Mainland. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the roadmap for the National Learning Management System solution um, that we're currently working on. Uh, there's nothing to really show you yet, uh, but next April 1st, we're preparing to launch something that will, uh, I think, be an enhanced solution for everybody in the sector. And next slide, please. So here are the key components of the Learn IT to Teach project. Uh, first of all, the portal, learnit2teach.ca, where uh, we publish news about uh, learning technology and its role in settlement language training. Uh, we have resources. Uh, for example, there's a, an annotated bibliography on link uh, blended and online language training with um, links to about 50 or 60 articles that we think are pertinent for for all of us in the sector, and information about the, the team that works on our training and uh, mentoring and e-learning development. The next major element is the EduLink courseware, which is a software aligned to a specific curriculum at edulink.org. So it's it covers link levels one to eight, and it's four skills, uh, listening, reading, speaking, and writing. and uh, those courses are, are not one size fits all solutions, but I'll get into that a little later. And as well, our, our developers are constantly improving and augmenting the courseware. And uh, the courseware, by the way, is now enabled for mobile devices. It has been for about a year and a half. So we, we can bypass the ancient desktop computers in the lab and learners can study anywhere they have an internet connection for their devices devices such as cell phones or tablets, smartphones, I should say. So we have a wide variety of courses already set up at various CB, CLB levels. Those are started courses. There's about 40 of them. And then the final uh, major building block is the, the five-stage teacher training at learnit2teach.org that I will describe a little further on. So on this slide, you can see how the interlocking resources on which the learner courseware is based uh, work with each other. In the beginning were the link, link curriculum guidelines and the CLBs. But the real foundation for the EduLink courseware was laid in 2007 to 9 with the development of the link activities books. At the time, uh, learning objects, discrete uh, skill building units of e-learning courseware were, were developed for most of the activities in the books. I should point out though, that the books and the, the learning objects were developed with, with uh, funding from Ontario region of citizenship and immigration, as it was called at the time. So they tended to be a little Ontario centric, but we've circled back on them and uh, uh, made them more broadly uh, accessible and usable in other regions. Now, the link activities books were, of course, skill building, not the task-based learning required to make uh, PBLA possible. So beginning in 2014, while we revisited the learning objects to modernize the underlying technology, we also began adapting them to support PBLA. To, today, there are several hundred learning objects at CLB levels one to seven available to link teachers. So here you can see four of the five uh, teacher training stages. Uh, so, sorry, I know it looks like five, but uh, one of them is a smaller one I'll describe. Um, all of these training stages are free for link professionals and their programs. 
we, we host the courseware and the learning objects. And we provide, uh, in addition to the actual training, we provide live help to Edulink users in the form of a synchronous chat uh, for any professionals encountering technical or pedagogical issues. Um, so I'll, I'll describe these stages in front of you now. Many of you will be familiar with them because I know a lot of teachers in BC have done one or more of them. Um, stage one is typically a face-to-face -face, uh, session, uh, usually in a computer lab, but it can be done with bring your own device. It takes about two and a half hours and teachers uh, experience the courseware from the learner's point of view. So it's a good way to kind of dip your toes in blended learning. Pre-stage two is uh, like the other uh, three stages uh, that are after stage one, takes place online, but by that point, each teacher has a, an online mentor. It takes about two hours, and the whole point of pre-stage two is to get uh, link teachers up and running with a course suitable for their learners and their CLB level. So it takes about two hours. Stage two itself uh, takes about 10 hours online mentored, and uh, it, it educates, uh, trains teachers on how to edit the course. Uh, by edit, I mean take control of the course uh, and adapt it for their own purposes and their own uh, regional or local needs. And then stage three, uh, which takes up to 25 hours, um, teachers actually become quite expert at adapting the course. They take control of all the features within Moodle that uh, are necessary to edit the course for their purposes. And finally, stage four takes uh, up to 35 hours. It's not for everybody. It's really for uh, settlement language training professionals who are looking to develop their own uh, learning objects, their own online resources. Um, all of these stages, uh, after all of these stages, a certificate is provided. So uh, uh, you're supported in terms of taking a credential back to uh, your uh, organization. Courseware updates. Uh, the most important update to the Courseware has been upgrading it to uh, so it's mobile compatible. This way learners uh, have easier access using their own devices. Um, and of course, this means that at least to some extent, the uh, language lab and the old computers in it is are no longer necessary. Uh, another important upgrade of the courseware has been the addition of the PBLA section. Uh, the section provides ready-made tools for needs assessment, goal setting, self-reflection, activities to introduce the language companion and PBLA, as well as a simple e-portfolio solution. And we've expanded the number of multi-level courses based on needs, uh, especially in rural areas. Um, uh, link teachers are working in uh, sometimes in the old time uh, one room schoolhouse where every level or many levels of, of, uh, link pro of language proficiency are represented in the same group. And we continue to upgrade, uh, update learner support resources as we add new activities to the courseware. Uh, looking ahead, I'll talk about that in a second. So what's in the pipe? Um, well, in 2015, some of you may remember, in the second last call for proposals by IRCC, uh, they asked for uh, proposals on building a national learning management system solution. Um, our proposal was successful and we're now in uh, the process of uh, developing it. It's going to be called avenue.ca because uh, partly because it has to be bilingual. And uh, it's pretty exciting. The, the addition of web conferencing um, in the form of uh, an open source uh, conferencing solution, Big Blue Button. The implementation of an attendance plug plugin enables the LMS to support flexible delivery op options, including 
100% online courses and remote learning in a virtual classroom. And uh, the organization and uh, other agencies are already developing and releasing new PBLA compatible modules. So those of you who read the uh, digital newsletter we put out once every month will be seeing announcements of new PBLA, PBLA compatible uh, materials. And we are collaborating with other national projects to realign the courseware to new national curriculum guidelines and uh, a new portal uh, in the form of avenue.ca is in the works. The portal will include integration with Tutela, so there'll be a single login to both EduLink and Tutela, allowing teachers to import or export teaching resources directly from one to the other and ease the development of custom courseware by teachers. And uh, teachers, uh, individual teachers, will of course have their own accounts and they'll have their own little private resource area uh, on avenue.ca. And we are developing a semi-automated courseware builder. Um, and for PBLA folks looking for a better solution than binders, we are developing an e-portfolio solution on avenue.ca that will be compatible and very supportive of PBLA. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, the evaluation is really part of everything we do. Um, we're constantly working to improve and to, to understand uh, the environment, the ecosystem in the language training sector that we operate in. So have all link programs transitioned to link blended learning? I have to say that uh, BC is probably uh, the region where we've had the most, uh, the broadest uptake. Uh, Congratulations, you are uh, the best innovators around right now. But the answer uh, to the question of has everyone transitioned? No, not yet. Um, as we saw in the poll that uh, Julie did earlier. Last year, we completed a project impact report to analyze how the sector is innovating. There are pockets of excellence represented by whole programs that have taken up the EduLink module model or create their own model, model as uh, Olga's ISS of BC has. And there are other programs that only, have only for, taken the first baby steps, sometimes just a teacher or two going through pre-stage two and putting the courseware to work. Um, the different mandates of PBLA and Learn IT to Teach can partially explain delays by some sector professionals. They've worked to realize the benefits of PBLA locally uh, per, perhaps deferring blended learning innovation to a future date. However, the result for learners of these delays is continuing barrier barriers to online learning. Many newcomers, as we all know, uh, struggle to balance their communication needs with low incomes, family responsibilities, and entry-level employment. Our online learning, we feel, online or blended, is part of the link solution to program access, waiting lists, and the day-to-day -day struggle of newcomers to communicate in English. This is just uh, a tiny sample of what's in that impact report. Um, but we can see that, uh, and these, these tables, by the way, are based on a survey done by TESOL Canada a couple of years ago. Um, we can see that many teachers in the sector have good access to technology. Uh, so for example, 86% had internet or Wi-Fi access, 85% um, had uh, CD players, and 59% had dedicated computers in the classroom. Um, while more than two thirds had access to a computer lab, less than one third had computers in the classroom or on wheels. And finally, I just wanted to touch on uh, Everett M. Rogers and uh, the diffusion of innovations and innovation series. We've been inspired and guided uh, by uh, the work done in this sector over the past uh, 70 years. Everett M. Rogers was, uh, is, uh, has passed away now, but he was the guru, uh, almost invented innovation theory. He argued that innovation in education takes a long time, up to 20 years. Um, 
my estimate, I'm, I'm thinking that blended learning has been hypothetically possible for at least 15 years now. So we're about 15 years in. So the big question is, will blended learning uh, be operating across the sector in five years? Uh, I think the answer is a, a big maybe. Um, for some of the reasons Olga described, and, and Suzanne I know is gonna touch on some of this too, there are still significant barriers. But the slide you're looking at diagrams the roles of various actors in innovation as identified by, by Rogers. The first to innovate are, of course, uh, in the bottom left, the innovators. But Rogers argued that the most influential change agents are the second group, the early adopters, because other professionals rec recognize that these early adopters are a little more reluctant, perhaps scheduled, uh, skeptical. He argues they may have more influence on the later waves. Uh, maybe we all get a little, uh, we all approve of a little skepticism when it comes to innovating. One of Rogers' most important conclusions was that innovations is essentially a communications process. So it's all tied up with leadership, management. And uh, when I mention leadership, I mean, Anybody can be a leader, uh, including students, uh, in driving uh, technology innovation. So I'll finish with a brief quote from Rogers. Uh, More than anything else, it was the social power of peers talking to peers about the innovations that led to adoption of the new idea. So uh, just to say thank you again to Julie, Amza, and to all of you for attending, I'm looking forward to your questions. If you want more information or to book a training event, would you please email us at admin at learnit2teach.ca and please uh, feel free to visit the project portal at learnit2teach.ca. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Rob. Very informative and it's great to get to have a little sense of what is also upcoming. So service providers can preview what, what is being adopted. So please send us your questions for Rob using the question box, Twitter, or email your questions to apodal at amsa.org. We will uh, share a few questions with you, Rob, right now. So the first question is somewhat related to the link learning objects you were talking about different uh that you had 40 courses at various clb levels i've heard from smaller centers where classes are continuous intake and multi-level and students only attend for two to three months that teaching link level four or lower would be challenging for them to to bring the blended learning piece into do you have any tips for using blended learning for lower levels is this recommended I, I, there are lots of people doing it, and I think it really uh, depends on a lot of support from the teacher um, and also keeping things fairly simple. Uh, for instance, you wouldn't want to use all the bells and whistles available in Moodle. You'd probably uh, restrict it to keep the interface fairly simple. Okay, thanks, Rob. We have a question here from an audience uh, member. Will avenue.ca still use Moodle or will it use a different learning management system? Absolutely, it's gonna use Moodle. Mo Moodle is our preferred solution. I didn't have time to or the time to share our mission, vision, value statement, but we're dedicated to using open source solutions developed by educators as opposed to proprietary solutions developed purely by technologists. So yes, it will be Moodle, uh, based on Moodle 3.7, I believe. Great, thanks, Rob. Another question from Sandra is, how many teachers have completed stage four? So that might require a little bit of research, but if you're able to comment on that, that would be great. I always come back to it yeah yeah let's we'll have to circle back on that one because I'd probably mislead you if I did a guesstimate okay 
let's see here. I do have another question for you. So this is about smaller LTOs, smaller language training organizations. How can these smaller language training organizations best support the training of teachers in the online learning platforms while they're still working? This is hard for all organizations, but particularly those where there's only one teacher or a few teachers and link instructors, and they're wearing many hats already. So what is the time demand when learning to teach through the online platforms? And, and what advice do you have for smaller language training organizations that want to try to adopt some of this online learning? Well, what we offer is, is completely scalable from a small organization all the way to a big one with dozens or teachers or, or a small one with just one. Um, and we're ready to support you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, through mentored uh, online training or the live help um, function we have uh, in EduLink and, and LearnIT2Teach.org. So that live help is, is uh, hosted by a, a link professional who's also a learning technologist uh, during office hours, so roughly nine to three or four every day. Um, <clears throat> Other advice I'd have, I, I know we know the challenge that many teachers have is finding paid release time. Um, but I do know of one model, one agency in, in uh, the east of Canada, that uh, instead of paying teachers by the hour, in other words, the contact hour with learners plus some prep time, um, they put teachers on salary and leave them enough time uh, to uh, make it possible to do constant professional development. Um, I had another thought. Uh, oh, about preparation time. Um, we do get a little pushback from teachers who find the first time they, they adapt uh, um, an EduLink course to their own purposes that it takes a while. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. But uh, once you set up the course once, the second time you roll it out for a new cohort, um, it's really a matter of tweaking it. So uh, it can be liberating in terms of preparing for a new group. Uh, if you've already prepared a, a Moodle course at, say, CLB level three or four before. Hope that answered the question, but it, it's a complicated issue. That's great. Thanks, Rob. Just one final question before we move on to the last portion of the webinar. And this is about leadership, innovation and leadership. How can practitioners support and promote learning technology, innovation and leadership? Or how can um, leadership, how can leaders be supported? What, what tools do you have for, for those leaders in link organizations to help their teams adopt these new online practices? Well, I didn't have time to include a description of the leadership course we offer, but we also offer a 12-part a, a um, leadership course called Learning Technology Innovation Leadership um, that's been running for about four years now. Uh, eight cohorts have been through uh, stage one, uh, which is the first six units. And a fifth cohort is just going through stage two. And um, it, it's aimed, initially it was aimed at administrators because way back we did develop an administrator's guide to link blended learning. But we've rewritten the guide and we've re redeveloped the course. So it's not just for managers, it's also for lead teachers. So, or people aspiring to be lead teachers. So I'd, I'd highly recommend that. And if, if you are interested, just send us an email um, to admin at Learn IT to Teach. And uh, we'd love to get you involved in that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. We do have another question from Nilufar, but we'll save that for the last final Q&A. So please stay tuned and we'll have Rob answer your question there. So we'll move to our final poll number five. Please rate the general level of digital literacy skills your clients have. 
Do they have a high threshold of digital literacy? Are some supports required or a lot of supports required? So you can see the results of the poll there. So on that note, we know that digital literacy skills often present difficulties to adopting online service delivery. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Suzanne Smythe. Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Smythe is an associate professor at the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University. Her research is concerned with adult digital literacies, pedagogies, and justice. Suzanne sits on the Research Advisory Committee with the BC Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, is a board member of Collège Éducacentre, and a member of the Downtown East Side and Burnaby Now Literacy Roundtables. She is the Faculty of Education Liaison for a Community Adult Literacy Program, CALP, in Digital Literacies at the Burnaby Neighbourhood House, where she currently offers research support on a Digital Literacy Exchange Program grant from Industry Canada. Suzanne will now speak to digital equity and access. And so I'll hand it over to you, Suzanne. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And it was really nice um, to uh, listen to the past two presentations because I think this is actually, um, there'll be a nice opportunity to touch on some of the really interesting points that have already been made. Um, and then also um, bring in some of the uh, nitty gritty issues about digital equity and digital literacies and digital justice, um, which I'd like to talk about in terms of how we might be thinking about planning and designing digital technology environments and pedagogies from a digital inclusion perspective. Um, and I notice I don't have my email here, but I will um, provide it at the end if anyone wants to contact me. Um, and um, as Julie said, um, I'm involved in a number of digital literacy projects um, in the Lower Mainland. So I wanna state right away that my experience is not gonna be able to speak directly to digital access and digital inclusion issues outside of the large urban center of the Lower Mainland. Um, but there are certainly differences between um, urban centers, rural, semi-rural, um, semi-urban areas that I really do want to acknowledge and speak to um, in, the, in the presentation. Um, and I am going to be drawing on some of our research findings in, in some of the various studies um, in different settings. Um, so I'm hoping that I can um, draw on some actual, some of the uh, research that we've been doing. And I, you know, obviously invite your questions later um, if I skip over things or it's not clear. So I, um, one of the digital inclusion is, uh, digital inclusion and digital equity are sometimes used interchangeably. Digital inclusion, uh, it comes out of work that has been done with, uh, among collaborations between literacy groups, libraries and community-based agencies starting in the US but also now in Canada that sees digital inclusion as a three-legged stool. Um, and it includes access to internet adoption, in other words, digital literacy skills, and, um, and the resource to actually adopt digital technologies. And then also um, the capacity to apply those digital literacy skills to everyday life. Um, and that speaks to also how those digital environments are designed and how people experience um, digital environments. So I'm gonna to speak to each of these, um, but for me, digital inclusion, all these, these are really important um, factors, but I like to think about this in terms of digital equity. So what we wanna ask or wanna keep in mind is that what access adoption or the application of digital literacy skills looks like will be different depending on people's po different positionalities around income, ethnicity, uh, language and education backgrounds, uh, back life experiences, age, gender identities, and so on. So we, um, it's really useful and has been very important in our research to understand how different groups experience the internet and, and, and understand that it's not the same for everybody 
And so we're not looking for inclusion as everyone being equal, we're rather looking for equity and paying attention to how different people experience the internet um, and digital environments and how we might respond to their different needs. Um, so maybe the next slide, please. So access, um, traditionally, internet access has uh, speaks to whether or not people can get online. And it feels, it seems like it's a very simple, straightforward question. Do you have access to the internet? Um, but we have, what we've realized in our, uh, in our work in, the, in different settings is that, that the, the answer to that is always yes, but no and. <laughs> so in other words, we have to think about access to the internet in terms of um, whether it the speed, whether it's reliable and secure, and whether it's affordable. Um, we also need to think then about who is, uh, which groups are likely to be excluded from affordable and reliable internet and devices and why. The other thing about um, access to the internet is it really does depend on the device people are using. So when people bring an, a very old kind of cell phone and ask for help, that's gonna be a very different issue around access to the internet and how we get that phone, that phone to work than if they bring kind of a brand new laptop. So again, devices, how they're designed and what they can do um, is also really important for internet access. Next slide, please. Um, so the second pillar then, so once so, and if you notice what we have are a lot of questions because what we found is rather than tell people, this is what access and adoption and application look like, what we have found is that it's important to ask questions and pay very close attention to what's going in in our local settings in terms of how we answer them. So in terms of adoption, what adoption refers to is the uptake and relevance of content, the design, um, and appropriate kinds of digital literacy education. So the kinds of questions we ask there is, you know, do people have the knowledge and skills to access and use technology? Um, who designs technologies for whom and how does this matter? And what this gets to is the idea that while we can teach digital literacy skills, and I'm going to talk a lot about, I'm going to talk more about that later because I can see from your poll that that's an area of interest for you. Um, but when, when we're thinking about digital literacy skills, we also have to think about how online platforms and environments are designed because it's not always a matter of lack of digital skills in terms of access and adoption. It's also a matter of whether those online environments are designed, um, are, are well designed for the needs of particular users. I don't know if people have had opportunities to go online to some government websites to um, help people apply for social services or applying yourselves, but sometimes those interfaces um, pose some very difficult um, obstacles um, that have to do with design and not necessarily people's digital literacy skills. So um, that's a really important factor that we don't often talk about, but that really came out in our research. And so once again, are tools and interfaces and platforms being built and designed with different um, literacy and positionality, different identities of people in mind? So the third pillar of that stool um, is application. Um, and what, what we're really getting at there is do technologies contribute to a more equitable and inclusive modes of education? And I would also say more broadly to a more equitable society. Um, whose needs are served by the technologies that we're using? Who benefits and who doesn't? Can people, communities, and businesses improve their outcomes through the use of technology? Or is technology intensifying existing inequalities? Um, so just to take a pause there, one example of this is um, a lot of people that we work with and who come to our settings um, Either they're participating in education programs elsewhere and they come to drop-in centers for help, uh, or they just come in because they need to do different kinds of tasks online, applying for jobs, getting an email, and so on. And what we found is that when, um, because they're relying on a public access computer, they often have to go through two or three 
uh, verification protocols. And often they don't have a cell phone to, so often that the second pro, the first protocol will be your email password. The second one will be, do you have a cell phone number in case you lose access to your account? And lots of people don't have that. Um, and the third protocol might be a second email or a work email, um, which they don't have either. So it really made this, these kinds of issues make us alive to how some people are more marginalized in terms of um, online environments, while as others just find them super easy and fluid. So I think when you're thinking about designing technologies and um, who has access to technologies, especially for the kinds of really important new work you're doing in planning and designing um, new digital environments for um, adult English second language learners, is what are their existing um, what kinds of access do they have already? And how might, how are the kinds of ways that they're using technology um, either alienating them or including them? And so one of the questions we really have to ask more and more is, is going online beneficial to people or an unwelcome necess necessity? Um, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit more in a minute. So next slide, please. So one of the things, um, when we go back to this issue of internet access, and, in, um, and I guess it's important to see that access, adoption, and application, those three-legged stools are interconnected. So if one of those stools, one of those um, legs isn't there, you know, we do not have inclusion and we don't have an equitable system. So if we, re if we think about digital equity and inequity in Canada, 86% um, of Canadians have access to a home internet connection. Um, and that seems like a lot. And in the past, government policy has said, you know, we almost have complete internet access now. So we can close down all the computer access programs and the community, um, community and computer access programs. We don't really need to do any more around digital inclusion because everyone's online. Look at those stats. But when we go a little further down and we look at who's online, things get more complex. So almost all households in the top income quartile, 98% quartile, um, of those with household incomes of $94,000 or more had home internet access. So if you're making, you know, up in the upper 90s um, of your salary, you probably have high speed, ubiquitous access, multiple connections to internet in your home. However, only 58% of households in the lowest income quartile, um, so household incomes of 30,000 or less, have a home internet connection. Um, and I think this is really important because if you don't have a home internet connection, a high speed internet connection, then you're probably not using the internet very often. And that affects fluency and digital literacy skills that people might bring to your programs. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, another factor then in internet connection is, and why it's more complicated than simply access to the internet, is that there's very, there's actually quite significant differences in speed and latency. So latency is kind of um, the, the, the speed at which it takes information to upload and to flow on, online, just to put it, you know, in quite simple terms. So, for example, in rural areas of Canada, um, it it's the the download speed speeds, the speeds at which it um, your the, the internet will allow you to download documents and so on and to stream as well as to upload are significantly slower than in urban areas with a high variability. So, in other words, it's not always reliable. Um, and you can see the latency, a very high latency means that you're going to get that weird stuttering thing when you're trying to stream video. This has, um, I think, very important implications for how people might experience online learning um, outside of um, urban areas. So another issue that we have learned about affordability is that even when people do have an internet connection, and I think um, there's a 2000, in 2019, the new census is going to be looking at who has access to the internet and how they're connected. One of the things that really needs to be cross-checked is that sometimes people are opting for an internet connection because it's so important to them, but they will then make choices and they will forego other basic necessities. So for example, um, 
the Public Information Advocacy Coalition did a study, and actually they updated it recently, I think, um, that people are going to be cutting household expenses um, in order to have internet connection. So that can that phenomena can really mask the fact that actually in Canada the internet is not very affordable. High speed, reliable internet is we have some of the highest costs for that in the world. Um, so just this is I think something again to keep in mind about the complexity of access and how it's different for different groups. Next slide, please. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on digital literacy just in terms of the interest of your group. Um, one of the things um, that we've learned about digital literacy is that we can't assume that simply access equates with efficient or beneficial use. So we can't just say that because people have a device and access to the internet, that they can now, they're good to go. What we've, what we've learned is that when um, people have all kinds of different practices and habits and workarounds when they use the internet, um, because very few people in fact have had access, or few adults anyway, have had access to consistent digital, liter digital literacy education. So it's really important to have kind of appropriate, consistent, um, responsive digital literacy education to take advantage of what the internet and technologies can offer. Um, and this has to do in, um, with application, which I'll get to later, because if people haven't, um, don't have access to uh, skills in terms of privacy and so on, this can really actually um, diminish their experiences online in terms of, you know, you can get your data stolen or, and so on, which we'll go into in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I really love, there was a study that I found and you know how it's really nice when you read a study and you think, oh yes, that's exactly what we found too. And there's a kind of resonance. And one of the things that we have been working on and publishing about um, uh, is re resonates um, in a meta analysis of lots of different digital literacy studies that Little John Be Beetham and McGill uh, conducted. And so what they found is among, the, I guess they must have looked at about 60 different studies of adult digital literacy. Um, and they found that actually digital literacies are best acquired and learned through the continued development and refinement in different contexts, not through one-off instruction. So, for example, we see a lot, um, especially in the States, um, but also with the digital, um, the, the DELP that's come out, um, that there's, people are uh, offering a lot of workshops on basic digital skills, and those are awesome, but people need time to practice and return and engage with um, those skills on an ongoing basis. So we can't assume that just simply doing a one-off workshop is going to kind of, you know, have people um, all kind of, they're all digital literate and they're all going to go out and be able to use tools indefinitely. It's an ongoing issue. Um, and in the same kind of vein, learning technologies by doing is more effective than uh, trying to teach generic skills. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through these because, uh, um, I think a lot of these might be, you might be familiar to you as people who uh, work with adults, but one of the important things that we have found is that digital literacy education and, and who has access to digital literacy education should not be, uh, should not be decided based on people's language skills. Um, everyone needs access to digital literacy, no matter what their language level is. Um, and that's an important issue of access. Um, the other issue is that we should really, we found that valuing multilingual competencies uh, is very important so that when people are learning something new, they really do need access to, they need, they need the opportunity to explain to each other in their own languages and then bring that learning to the technology that they're, you know, that they're trying to access. Um, next slide, please. So just to just in summary, then we have to think about uh, the design of the technologies and we have to recognize that people who have experienced trauma and members of groups that are targeted for online hate might have good reasons to fear the Internet. 
Um, Canadians are increasingly fearful of data being collected on them in online platforms and social media. And we found that, you know, there's probably good reason with some of the issues around Facebook. And so it's really important for organizations to think about how they're going to address the, the issue of data surveillance and how being transparent about how data is used. Because fear of the internet is one is a huge issue that will keep people away from the digital literacy skills they need. So I think I'll just leave these up here in conclusion because I need to wrap up. But um, just uh, the main point is don't assume anything about connectivity. Be responsive to the changing conditions of connectivity um, among your learners. That digital literacy education is not a once and for all and it's not a one size fits all. And always ask who is excluded and who is included in the kinds of um, designs and technologies that we're introducing. How are different groups going to be affected? Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for your informative presentation. Please send your questions, everyone, for Suzanne, Rob, and Olga using the question box, Twitter, or email your questions to apodal at amsa.org. So Suzanne, let's start with uh, you. I've got a question for you here. And that is, could you tell us what BYOD stands for and the benefits and drawbacks of this type of approach to settlement service delivery and language learning? Sure, so BYOD is bring your own device. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very common uh, practice now in K-12, as well as I think I've noticed it now in some adult education settings where learners are asked to bring their own device to class um, um, because often, well, for two reasons. One, it gets around the lack of technology uh, infrastructure in, in education settings. Um, and two, sometimes when you're trying, when you're teaching people things like passwords or how to um, configure their device, it's most useful to do that when people are using their own device rather than teaching them on a generic tool and then having to go and apply it themselves. So in those settings, um, in those situations, it, it's great. The drawbacks are that not everyone has a device. So if, you're, if your education programs assume that everyone has a device, then there's going to be built-in exclusion um, among those who don't. The second issue or the second drawback is that because of the kinds of equity issues I described earlier, some people will have very old devices. They won't have well-maintained devices. They don't have access to tech support. So they might bring a device, but it won't be working well, and it won't be able to connect to, uh, to the internet, or if there's all kinds of issues that, that evolve around that. And the third issue is that some devices are good for production, like, a, like a, to, to make, to create online, like a laptop. But if people are bringing a phone or an iPad, it's really hard to ask people to do a lot of writing on that because it's just not, they're not designed for production, they're designed for consumption. Thank you, Suzanne. If you're able to share your webcam with us, that would be great. We can also oh. see you. And I have another question. Okay. That, um, oh, sure, go ahead while I just, sorry. Okay. That's okay. So okay, the question is a bit, bit deeper. Hi there. <laughs> so this question is, how do we make better use of online delivery in terms of the, the things that Olga and Rob were speaking of? How do we ensure we're all delivering in British Columbia here quality, effective programming and services, regardless of the format, whether it's face-to-face -face with the online component blended, the online only, or some of these drop-ins. Do these mediums need to be approached as separate? How, do you have any tips overall based on what you shared and, and some what, what we can look at in terms of the big picture for better online supports and delivery? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and to be really honest, we're, we're a little bit, um, this is an emergent issue in BC and Canada. We don't have a, you know, a national education, uh, we don't have a national adult education policy framework or we don't have a digital literacy framework. Um, some people would like that because it might provide common guidelines and common goals that then all 
all adults ostensibly in the country um, could be part of if, um, if there was consistent funding um, across different programs. But we just don't have that infrastructure in Canada around adult education. We don't have a very good integration between the link and the um, adult ESL um, programs and say, for example, adult basic education, literacy and workplace training. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing. <laughs> but it, so I, I think that um, this would be kind of a something to work toward is a, is a kind of a national, um, maybe agreed upon common goals. Um, however, we also have to think about um, the, the, these important differences between rural and urban, between um, how different groups experience the online environment. And it, it's going to be really important within, um, within an overall kind of common framework of values to be able to respond uh, to our local settings. And, you know, there's really no, I don't think there's going to be a silver bullet or a magic way to make, um, to make digital literacy skills equitable and accessible to everyone um, unless we pay attention to our community and to kind of just keep on asking the questions that I've, you know, I've, um, I've offered and that there's probably, there's a lot more of those questions is that we really just have to be very responsive to what's going on in our, in our programs, but have mechanisms to share what's going on with other programs so that we can begin to build kind of collective knowledge. And from there, perhaps um, kind of a more solid infrastructure. So I, I think it has to come from the bottom up. And certainly there are movements in Canada now uh, with the Digital Justice Lab in Toronto, some of the uh, is work on digital justice that we're doing where that work is starting. But I wanna say that we're early days. Thanks very much, Suzanne. I think you answered that very well. And I, I really liked a lot of the suggestions that you made and that it goes beyond our, us as settlement serving organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a bigger picture there. And so I appreciate you mentioning that. So we're going to open up the question and answer period now for the rest of our panelists. So it's a wider Q&A. We don't have too much time left, but I just wanted to get in some of those questions that came through. There is a question, I think maybe Rob, you might be best suited to answer this. It is, the latest Moodle version is 3.7, released in May 2019. Are you planning to upgrade the Moodle version for Edulink? As there is a lot of, there are a lot of bugs that have been fixed in the newer versions and a lot of options have been added. Yeah, we, we, we try to keep up with the new versions. Um, we, don't uh, we didn't necessarily move from 3.1 to 3.2 automatically because it is a big job to transition all the courses that we host. But uh, yes, we are intending to use 3.7 and we do have another nine months to work out the bugs before we launch avenue.ca. Thanks, Rob. Here's another question. Should organizations develop their own blended and online courses or wait until IRCC releases their learning management solution in March, 2020? Oh, that's for me, I guess. Well, I think uh, you may uh, be nothing, best to nothing start. Nothing to stop you it. now from going ahead and setting up. We, we already make it possible. And when avenue.ca does become available April 1st, there will be a way to migrate every course that's on Edulink over to Avenue. So there, there, no, there's no reason to, to delay, frankly. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, this is a, coming back to your presentation, Olga. In your opinion, and based on your personal experience as an instructor, online and in face-to-face in -face delivery, do you think new teachers should work with learning technologies in their classrooms right away? Or wait till they have a stronger grasp of the basics of classroom teaching, such as lesson planning, learning outcomes, Canadian language benchmarks, etc.? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, in my opinion, they should wait a bit. I know that at ISSOBC we used to teach, to train new teachers right away, uh, as soon as possible, but it was overwhelming for them to learn anything that, you know, PBLA implementation is 
hard <laughs> for new teachers. It's, I think it's really hard to get in this new job now. And, and so now we delay, we wait until they've been working for a couple of months and then we start the training. And the training can, as I mentioned before, it takes about 10, 11 hours, but it can be stretched out a bit. So it can be spread out um, for several, you know, several days or weeks, whatever the teacher feels comfortable with. So definitely, I would say wait and do training step by step. Thanks, Olga. Okay, so we are um, nearing the end of the webinar. We're running out of time. We don't have any more questions coming in from the audience, but I do want to thank everybody for sending those questions in. Oh, there's one more. Rob, will the Learn IT to Teach training change with Avenue? Should teachers continue to support the stages at this time or wait? We will send the answer to that question. I just wanted to um, see if there are any last words from you as presenters. So, um, Rob, Olga, and then Suzanne, last words? <laughs> Just words of encouragement that <laughs> it can often be quite daunting to keep up with technology, but the rewards are there for the teachers and the learners, I think. Thanks, Rob. Olga? Yeah, second that, second that, totally. I think there are lots of benefits for the learners, although there are barriers, but we are working on those and supporting those students. and. And there are barriers for teachers too. I just think we should be open-minded and ready to constantly learn. It's all about lifelong learning. Thank you, Olga and Suzanne. Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's you know technologies are here, um, but I think we have a lot of influence in how we use them, uh, who benefits from them, how we design them, and so. I would just encourage people as educators to do what they always do, which is to pay very close attention to the role of technologies in their learners' lives and bringing those into the classroom in ways that um, don't assume access, but, uh, but rather pay very close attention to how different people are experiencing online life because the ecosystems are constantly changing and um, it's not, it's not going to be um, a settled issue. <laughs> yeah. The next thing is 5G and then everything changes all over again. <laughs> okay, thanks, Suzanne. Well, thank you, Suzanne, Olga, and Rob for all your work in helping support and prepare and participate in this webinar. Thank you for joining us today, everyone online and for sending in your poll results and questions for exploring online service delivery principles and practices. We will be emailing all of you an online evaluation form. Please take the time to fill it out as AMSA relies on the feedback provided in the evaluations to plan future events and trainings. We also will send in that email the links to the documents that we referred to during the webinar. A special thank you again, Olga, Rob and Suzanne for sharing their time and experiences to help support the settlement language section sector industry and thank you to the AMSA team, Khan, Alice and Sabrina on tech and questions and Melissa on social media. We will send out a notification on SettlementNet when the webinar is available on our website. If you don't receive the weekly updates for SetNet, please log on to our website and sign up. It's free for everyone. Again, we would like to thank immigration, refugees, and Citizenship Canada for funding this event today. Thank you everyone for tuning in and have a great day.